Hello everyone, Young Soya here at your service as always. Let's talk about first impressions. Whenever you're making a movie, a video, or a TV show, it's very important to leave a very memorable first impression, a taste of what's to come. This is no different in video games as there are many things that are important for making a great and unforgettable first impression, like the opening, the first levels, and as for the topic of this countdown, first bosses. Boss fights are one of those things that everyone loves in a video game, mostly because you're fighting someone or something much tougher than the enemies you fought before the actual fight, and who doesn't love a challenge? You're probably wondering, what's the best way for a video game to show that it has a lot of great boss battles? That's easy. First bosses. The first boss you ever fight in a video game is usually there as a demonstration of how boss battles are going to work in that respective video game. While most of them are pathetically easy and are memorable, I managed to find 15 first bosses and a few honorable mentions. They are a whole different story and I'm here to talk about every single one of them. You already know the rules by now, but just to be safe, I'm going with them anyway. Only one boss per franchise and only from games I played. So now with all that said, let's get this party started. There it is! What the hell? Is this the friggin' boss? We're in the front car! It's gotta be! Hurry! I have never seen anything like this. The Legend of Zelda is very well known for its amazing boss battles, but as for first bosses, not so much. They're either too easy or just plain forgettable, but there are two exceptions. The Dire Barber from Twilight Princess, and the number 15 on this list, the Lava Scorpion Gomer from Wind Waker. Remember when I said that most first bosses in the Zelda series are pretty easy to beat? Well, this one is... still pretty easy, but it's just a lot of fun to beat. I mean, just look at the size of that thing. It's freaking huge! And its attacks are nothing to snuff at. It can attack you by slamming one of its pincers at where you're standing, or trapping you with both pincers and breathe fire for unavoidable damage. So how do you kill this thing? Simple. You see that dragon tail up there? Use a grappling hook to swing on it, which causes the ceiling to fall on top of the goma, breaking its outer shell. Do this two more times, and you'll win. Right? Wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. After making the ceiling fall on top of it three times, Goma's outer shell breaks apart, which only makes him angrier and his attacks become faster and harder to dodge. But he's also vulnerable to your attacks now, so use the grappling hook to draw its head close to you and slash his eye until it's dead. Overall, the fight with Goma is pretty fun and definitely puts every other Gomas in Zelda series to absolute shame. But it's still a pretty easy boss fight, which is why it's not AI on this list. It ain't a Parasite Queen. She was just too easy for my taste. So let's see what kind of first boss Metroid Prime 3 has. But it's just as easy and pathetic as the Parasite. Or not? Talk about a huge beast! The Berserker world for Metroid Prime 3 Corruption is definitely someone you don't want to mess with. Unless you're everyone's favorite female space bounty onto herself, then in that case, yeah, you do have to fight him. At first this boss has an indestructible shield made out of Phazon, so none of your weapons will make a dent on him. Also his attacks include energy beams, shockwaves, and... Yeah! 
Yeah. And then he fires a bunch of purple wolves that are impossible to dodge. So instead of dodging them, you have to shoot them, causing them to rebound right back at him, breaking the shield protecting his weak spot. That's when you need to shoot his weak spot to damage him before the shield goes back up. Because when it does, you have to do the same thing as before until he finally dies. Sure, this guy may be pretty easy, but compared to the Parasite Queen, he's anything but easy. Also, he comes back later in the game, only much easier to kill. So overall, the Berserker World is pretty easy, yet fun fight. But may God help you if you think about facing this thing in hyper difficulty. Quanoa 2, such an underrated platforming game. Seriously, this game needs a lot more attention. It has awesome level design, spectacular visuals, amazing characters, and of course, outstanding boss battles. Hell, even the first boss, despite being easy to beat, is a lot of fun to fight against. Meet Fulgrad, the Armored Beast. The first monster sent by the Sky Pirate Rio Inga to eliminate Kornawa and his friends. At first glance you will think that this monster is pretty easy since all you have to do is use the enemies as weapons to end the super obvious rolling weak spot of death. Until his health bar is empty and you win. And you would be right since hitting his weak spot four times is all it takes to beat. Oh shit. This is when phase 2 begins, as Fulgrad now tries to attack you with its claws, which you can avoid by jumping over them, but you can defeat it the same way as in the first phase, by hitting its weak spot with one of the enemies until its health bar is empty. So if this boss is so easy to beat, why is it even on this list? Well, while Fulgrad is a very easy first boss, it's still a lot of fun to fight, no matter how many times you fought it. It also perfectly demonstrates how all the other boss fights will be like. It's like the perfect first impression. Also, the music playing this fight is pretty damn awesome. Just listen. Overall, Full Grand is the perfect definition of a great first impression and it's always a lot of fun to fight it, no matter how many times I've been with it. Too bad it's one of the easiest bosses on this list because otherwise it would have been a lot of iron. As we all know, the first bosses from the Mario series are usually the easiest, the most pathetic, and the most unmemorable to ever show up on screen. That is except for one, Cracktail from Super Paper Mario. You end up meeting him in the desert as Mario searches for the first pure art, and surprisingly, at first, he actually lets you pass to get the pure art without giving a fight, because Mario is the ever so cliché chosen. But then Dementio shows up and, like the devious trickster that he is, uses his magic powers to implement and a uh, computer virus in Fractale, causing him to go berserk. Now for the fight itself. This is strangely the only boss battle in which you need to use the 3D flipping mechanic to beat him, since the rest of the bosses can be beaten without that gameplay mechanic. Kind of misleading for the first impression, don't you think? Anyway, use the 3D flipping mechanic when he takes into the ground to jump on his back and then you have to grab nearby minions and throw them at his weak spot, which happens to be his antenna. Do this several times until he is destroyed, but if you take too long, Fractal will eventually make you fall back to the ground, but you have to wait until he is on the ground so you can get back on top of him and resume the battle. But what got him at number 12 on this list is one of the main reasons why Super Paper Mario is my favorite Mario game, the dialogue. Like with all characters in the game, most of Fractal's dialogue is incredibly funny and has a lot of charm into it, like CONTROL! ALT! DELETE! And also this little thing right here. Sell the too much? I do not understand. I do. I, I understood that reference. 
Overall, Flat Tail is the only first boss in the Mario series that not only actually good, but it also stands out among other first bosses in the video game history with its awesome battle and very clever dialogue. Though it's a shame that most of the other bosses in the game aren't as great as this one. When people ask me what's my favorite male Persona 4 character, my answer is always Yosuke Onamura. The guy is a happy-go-lucky quartz who we can't help but love, and he's also one of the most relatable characters in the Persona series. But would you expect a guy like him to have a dark side? Well, that's what happens when he confronts his shadow self, whether we name Shadow Yosuke. How did he get into this predicament? Well, to tell you the short version of Persona 4 story, people were found dead hanging from telephone posts, one of them being Yosuke's love interest, Saki Konishi. Shocked by her death, Yosuke and Yu Narukami, the protagonist of the game, go inside the TV world to investigate her death, only to find Shadow Yosuke instead. What follows is some creepy dialogue from Shadow Yosuke about his repressed emotions and Yosuke denying anything that he says as a truth, which only turns him into a monster bent on killing Yosuke. It sounds like someone just ordered a stupid looking- no, I am not using that joke. Anyway, the fight with Shadow Yosuke is actually pretty damn easy. Just spam Mizunagi's electrical attack and you'll win. Although he does have a wind attack that Narukami is weak to, so guard yourself when he guards as well. So, if this boss is so unbelievably easy, why is he even on the list, let alone why good than even Fractale? Well, it's not really the battle that made me love it so much, it was the symbolism behind it. As all Persona players know, a Shadow Self is a representation of a person's repressed negative emotions. And Shadow Yosuke represents Yosuke's resentment of living in a small country town with nothing much to do and also his desire for something interesting to happen. The far right design represents his reckless desire for excitement at the expense of others and the superhero like figure stuck in its back represents his dream of being seen as a hero to everyone. He is also the reverse form of the Magician Arcana, which represents one with power but is cruel and misuses that power. Certainly that design of his doesn't look so stupid now, does it? Overall, Shadow Yosuke has a lot of symbolism that makes the fight with him and several other shadows in the game unique, fun, yet disturbing as hell. I mean, just look at their faces. That's some serious nightmare fuel there. Get salmon, please! The assassins in normal heroes are all very likeable, very awesome, and very fun to fight. With a few exceptions like Shinobu, Million Gunman, and Jasper I do a terrible job of showing that revenge is not satisfying, Quark Jr. events on the series see Skelter Elder as the best first assassin they face in the series. But I haven't played normal heroes too, so I'll go with the next best choice, Death Metal. The fight with them is pretty epic, but it's also pretty easy and loses its excitement factor after a while. But what really puts it in the number 10 spot is Dead Metal himself. He's a British celebrity born armed with a giant creeper like Pink Katana, who's rich beyond his wildest dreams. Hell, even Travis admits he's jealous of his luxurious lifestyle, but for some reason he doesn't feel happy about it. In fact, he's bored of all the luxury he lives in. This is no paradise. Alright. Then what is it? A place to die. After Travis defeats him, he gives him the title of Holy Sword and tells him to master the ways of the assassin, right before getting his head chopped off. Decapitation! There. It is dead. <laughs> Sorry. I just had to do that. In conclusion, Death Metal is an awesome first boss, and the fight with him, although it's easy, gives us a great taste of, of how all the other assassins are gonna be fought. Thank you, Death Metal. Now enjoy your stay in paradise. Here's your ticket to paradise, mm. old man. If I 
try to pick a game from the Sonic series that has the best bosses, it would definitely be Sonic Generations. This game has hands down the best bosses of any Sonic game, with the exception of the final boss, which was incredibly annoying and frustrating. So you're probably thinking that I'm choosing the fight with Dead Egg Robot as my favorite first boss from the Sonic series, right? Well, it's not on the list. And I bet you're relieved about that since Dead Egg Robot in Generations was said to be very much inferior to the original boss fight with it in Sonic 2. And there's also a boss fight that you can get access to before the fight with Dead Egg Robot. You know which one I'm talking about. Sonic, ladies and gentlemen, everyone's favorite robot from the Sonic series, although mine is E123 Omega, happens to be the actual first boss of Sonic Generations, which is a remake of the boss fight with them in Sonic CD. If you think Metal Sonic is gonna go easy on you in the same way that a robot did, think again, because Metal Sonic has a huge variety of attacks that I can easily own you if you're not very careful, like an electric charge attack, electric force field, throwing streetwise at you, and a more powerful and faster electric charge attack. Attack. These attacks, while easy to avoid if you know what you're doing, keep you on your toes, not even giving you a second to think. After he executes one of his attacks, you'll power down to recharge, giving you a chance to strike him in the back. Do this three more times and you'll eventually destroy him for good. The Battle of Metal Sonic just plays and works epic in every way, especially the one thing the Sonic series always excel at, the music. Just listen to it. Overall, Metal Sonic is an amazing first boss and, from what I've heard, a huge improvement over the cheap and annoying fight with them in Sonic CD. Let's just hope this isn't the last we hear on Sonic's robotic wife. Everyone that one would feel like to fight someone with large mechanical legs and after you defeat them you get to use those legs to squash some enemies? That's what Mega Legs from Wayman 3 Udon Epic is all about. Or was it called Utstab? Eh, whatever. During the fight you see 5 switches spread around the arena, with one of them being lit. Once you step on it, one of the three lights in the center of the arena will light up. Stumble through more switches and the shock rocket power up pops up in the center of the arena, which you can use to shoot down the Udrum controlling the Hood Stumper. But pick out fast because if you take too long, Hood Stumper will crush it, making you repeat the whole process all over again. Just do this two more times and the Udrum is gone for good. But then an army of Udons shows up in the arena to stop Wayman to avenge their fallen soldier. So what does Wayman do to stop them? Easy! He takes control of the Hot Stomper and squashes them like bugs! You are no match for me! I have squashed you like bug! I have planned for you! More pain! <laughs> do I smell soiled baby diaper? Uh oh! I think someone soiled diaper! I promise you, pain without end! <laughs> Overall, the wood stumper made me easy, but it's still unbelievably satisfying to be it and use it to squash lots and lots of wood worms of standing in your way. Oh, and the music playing during the fight is just unfreaking believable. Win freaking win, baby!
Most bosses in the Spiral series are super awesome and a blast to fight. Even the first bosses in the series were somewhat awesome, with bosses from Spiral 3 being an honorable mention on the list. So which first boss did I pick from the Spiral series? Well, in Spiral 2, the main antagonist is an evil sorcerer named Ripto who has come to the world of Avalon to enslave it in all of its realms so he can get a shit ton of power from Himself. To do his usual dirty work, he has two huge, strong, but dim witted minions, Quash and Gold. And Quash ends up being the first one you face in the game, and the fight with him is freaking awesome. This is actually a change of pace from the other bosses on this list, since the fight with Crush is actually pretty challenging for a first boss. I mean, it has three phases! In the first phase, he attacks you with electrical shockwaves by stomping on one of the pads on the floor, and he has a force field protecting him during the attack. So the best way to attack him is to burn him while he moves to another pad, which causes him to slam the floor with his club and get himself crushed by boulders, no pun intended. Do this one more time and it's on to phase 2, where the pads change color where Crush now attacks you with the fireball. After hitting him two more times, phase 3 begins where he uses both fireballs and shockwaves to attack and after you burn him, instead of standing there and slamming his club to the ground, he'll chase you until he's close enough to squash you like a bug. Do this two more times and you'll be defeated and Ripton will throw an AC pit because of it. So overall, this is a great first boss battle with challenging difficulty and it shows that first bosses don't always have to be pathetically easy. They just have to be fun and epic in order to be enjoyable and memorable for years to come. Oh, and did I mention that this fight has one of the best boss teams in, in gaming? It's a boss from a licensed game. Everyone loves licensed games, right? No, Nix, nine, yet, nah, -uh, no way, never. It's okay, this licensed game is actually pretty good. It's none other than one of my favorite PSP games, Ben 10 Potato of Earth. Yeah, it's no surprise that I love the Ben 10 series, from the original show to the severely underrated Donkey Boys, which happens to be my favorite of the series. Problem. Anyway, back on topic. Ben 10 Protector of Earth is one of my favorite licensed games for a great number of reasons, one of them being the boss battles. Every single one of these bosses is awesome in their own way, including the first boss which has no name, so I'll just call it Giant Velgax Drum. Because I can. Before the battle even starts, you see something crashing in the Grand Canyon walking in your direction, which makes you think, whoa, that thing is huge. Am I gonna fight that huge robot? The answer? Yes. After wrecking lots of small robots throughout the Grand Canyon, the giant Vilgax drone manages to trap you and that's when the battle begins. At first it slams its giant arms onto the ground that can take a chunk of your health and stun you for a few seconds. It sounds like something that will become as annoying as Suozia's constant ramming into you from Shadow of the Colossus, but luckily once it slams its arms onto the ground, it becomes stuck and that is your chance to damage it. Once you've done enough damage, a quick time event, which is actually done right, appears where you manage to destroy one of the arms, causing massive damage. Same thing with the other arm, and eventually uncover the weak spot on its chest. Just keep hitting its weak spot or one of its broken arms, and another quick time event pops out to finish it off for good. After the battle is over, you get a nice, quick reward. Get it? Quick as in accelerate super fast? No. Dude, it literally hurts to listen to you sometimes. Whatever. So overall, the fight with giant Vilgax drone is an epic giant first boss that really shows that giant robots are awesome and are always tons of fun to fight against. Oh, and one more thing I need to mention. Omniverse does not suck! Getting beat. Help me! Keep it up.
What can I say about Crash to Insanity that hasn't already been said? This game has the best level design, the best story, the funniest moments, the best soundtrack, which by the way is made 100% out of human voices, and some of the best bosses in the series, one of which is the giant mechanical version of Crash built by Jonto Neo Cortex to destroy him once and for all whoever we call Mecha Bandicoot. Before you even fight this awesome machine, you still have to fight Vortex, as he throws bombs that destroy the arena and shoots razor beans at you. Just wait for him to chew the big and slow razor bean and spin it right back at his big freaking head three times and you'll finally face Brand new, hydraulically operated, twin brother, Mecha Bandicoot! The fight starts with Mecha Bandicoot shooting missiles which you avoid by going either left or right depending on how the missiles are launched, and then tries to hack you to pieces with its badass chainsaw. When it finds its nose razor, it just spin it right back at it twice and it will lose its badass chainsaw. It will be the same process two more times and it will lose its missile launch. So now the only method of attack it has is its nose razor, which fires razor beams that you have to spin right back at it three times to finally defeat it. This case is why eating your own food because it's bad for you. This fight is just epic in every way. There's no other way to describe it. It's that awesome. But there's another machine that proved to be a better first boss than this one. What is that machine? Let's find out. In Graduate Gladiator, you face tough and deadly challenges that test your skills as an intergalactic gladiator. Some of these include facing the Dread Zone champions known as the Exterminators. The first exterminator you face in the game is the giant robotic parody of Arnold Schwarzenegger named Shellshock. I'm not kidding, this guy acts and talks like Schwarzenegger all the time. Just listen. <laughs> Those American twins went down like wee little girly men. <laughs> yes, quite ironic, especially since they were actually teenage girls. <laughs> yeah, ironic. Hey, Juanita, are you wearing ace hard like underwear? <laughs> Told you so. Anyway, when you arrive to Planet Kronos, you'll notice that there are three challenges involving Shellshock. Well, guess what? That means you're gonna fight them three, count them three times! What? That's right, people. Three freaking times! In the first challenge against him, called Introducing Shellshock, he will attack you with loads and loads of missiles raining down upon you and with his rifle as well. Just use whatever weapon you have available to do some damage to them, particularly the dual vipers to get a skill point. Once you've done enough damage, he'll fly away and the challenge is over. Then you fight him again in Shellshock Return, where you fight him the same way as the first challenge, but this time he has a couple of new attacks called Bobby and Swing. Then the third and final challenge with them, game Showdown with Shellshock begins, where you're not only facing Shellshock, but a whole bunch of enemies as well. After dealing a certain amount of damage, Shellshock will run away to another room. That's when you have to turn a bolt crank to proceed to the next room to face him again. Rinse the repeat three more times and you'll finally have the pleasure of watching him fall to rest the mine. Overall, the fight with Shellshock really is more than meets the eye, but the fun factor turned out to freaking 13, and taking first boss fights to a whole new level of awesomeness. Have I already talked about how awesome the villains in the Sly Cooper series are? Well, they are, and I love almost all of them. Now that I said almost. I mean, there's Sir Rowley, Dimitri, Don Octavio, but the one that takes the cake when it comes to first bosses is in my favorite game of the series, and my all-time favorite PlayStation exclusive game, Sly Cooper Teams in Time. In Feudal Japan, we find out that Sly's ninja ancestor, Ryoichi Cooper, was blamed for selling prison sushi, got sent to prison, and had his restaurant shut down by a ruthless mercenary called El Refe. After getting Ryoichi out of jail and helping him take back his village and sushi Shop. El Refe manages to steal Ryoichi's gang and now it's up to Sly to retrieve it and then the fight begins. 
And what if they start out by shooting fireballs at you while you're running across the ropes? Dodge them until you reach a platform where he's standing and the actual fight starts with LFA using his swords to create a small fire shock right that you can jump over. Watch streamer Lightning running counterclockwise and the roll sweep from his Lightning charged swords. When he strikes the floor with his swords, that's your chance to don the samurai armor and to flat his fireball right back at him and then start beating him up until he roars. Repeating the whole process all over again. After after doing enough damage, LFA will escape and cut off a long sail that you can use as a bridge to catch up with him. Then phase 2 starts as LFA uses his swords to create a large fire shock wave which you can only avoid by wearing the samurai armor and then shoots a bunch of electrical spheres before sweeping you with his watch stream of lightning. Again, don the samurai armor when he strikes the floor with his swords and deflect his fireball right back at him and beat him up until he decides to escape again and the stories are going right before shouting one of the way he missed jokes ever. Hey Cooper! How do you like my crane style? <laughs> wow. I mean, just wow. Anyway, once you catch up to LFA again, you'll do the same large fire shockwave attack that you can only avoid by wearing the samurai armor, and also the same lightning sphere attack, but this time he attacks with two shorter streams of lightning that you can jump over to avoid them. After attacking you with two or three wall sweeps, just deflect his fireball right back at him using the samurai armor and beat him up until he's finally defeated. Wow, this boss fight was pretty epic. Maybe too epic to be your first boss. You know what? This looks more like a final boss battle rather than a first boss battle. Just look at this. In fact, you can show this to anyone who has never played or heard about the Sly Cooper series and then would immediately mistake this for the final boss fight of the game. That's how freaking amazing this boss fight is. And to think there are only two bosses that can top this show of epicness. I'll be honest, before I started editing this countdown, I didn't think of putting this boss on the list mostly because I haven't played the game this boss comes from at the time. That is until I recently started playing the game and I finally got to fight this boss. And it was so awesome that I simply couldn't leave it out of this list. Fairies and Gentle Gods? Metal Gear Ray! This boss. This freaking boss! I have no words to describe how epic it is. Okay, I'll try to explain as much as possible without screaming out of pure joy. Dear God, talk about massive. This is quite possibly the largest first boss I've ever faced in video games. And you get to fight right after cutting a few enemies into pieces to get used to the basic controls of the game. I put the Metal Gears on giant machines usually serving as the final boss in several Metal Gear games, so seeing one as a first boss comes off as a very unexpected surprise. This boss fight tests your basic skills like Ninja Run, Quarry, and the best one, Blade Mode, which allows you to cut the Metal Gear's armor into pieces. After doing this enough times, a quick time event pops out of nowhere where Wyden blocks the Metal Gear's attack, wraps its way, throws it up into the air, and slashes its giant arm into pieces in a very satisfying and badass fashion, thus ending this awesome battle of epic net. Whoa! What the hell? That thing's still alive? Yup, and it gets better from here. After chasing Sundowner for a while, the giant mechanical beast comes back for revenge, or should I say, revenge Good? <laughs> Cause it it's like revenge and vengeance combined and it's also the title of the game. It's funny! It's okay to laugh. No, it's really not. Anyway. The Metal Gear Ray keeps attacking you with razors and missiles as you keep slicing more pieces of its armor using blade. After doing enough damage, Raiden would start jumping from missile to missile until he reaches the Metal Gear and cuts off his remaining arm. And then runs down the falling building while avoiding lots of missiles, lands on its head, and proceeds to cut the giant machine of death in half. Overall, this first boss is a full package, being very epic and badass, introducing you to the basic characters of the game, has a very satisfying and entertaining finisher, and also has one of the best boss teams of all time. It's no 
want to make people like Obsidian's fan consider this the greatest first boss in video game history. But to me, there's only one first boss that tops this one. Let's find out who came on top, right after these honorable mentions. So what first boss could top Shellshock, El Jefe, and Metal Gear Ray, and all the while make them look like sissies in comparison? Well, how about three first bosses that aren't exactly as epic or breathtaking as either Shellshock, El Jefe, or Metal Gear Ray, but uh... Ah, screw this. It's Silent Sherry and Quest from Pokemon Black and White. Yay! I'm sorry guys, I tried so much to convince myself that Shellshock, El Jefe, and Metal Gear Ray are better first bosses, but... I just couldn't let these three gym leaders have anything other than the number one spot. So let me explain my choice before gen runners pick up their laser guns and lightsabers and start attacking me for picking these guys instead of rock, red, and blue. When you please just try it and see gym. You know it's a puzzle involving three tiles, each representing one of the three types, grass, fire, and water, which tests your knowledge of type matchups. All you have to do is step on the tile representing the type that's super effective against the type shown in the curtain in front of it. Then you can pass through to fight the gym leaders. Now this is where this gym battle stands out from all the others in the series. Instead of fighting just one gym leader, you have the choice of battling one of three gym leaders depending on which starter Pokemon you choose. So if you pick Snivy, you fight the fire type expert Shiri, if you pick Tepic, you fight the water type expert Quest, and if you pick Oshawa, you fight the grass type expert Siren. You know you're up for a real challenge when the first gym leader you face specializes in the type your starter is weak against, regardless of which which starter you pick. So no matter which starter you choose, you're gonna have a tough time facing either one of these guys. That is unless you manage to get the elemental monkey whose type is strong against the gym leaders from the green yard. In that case, this fight is super easy. But the reason why it's number one on this list is because of how unique it is compared to every other gym battle in the series. As you always end up facing a gym leader who has a type advantage against you, regardless of which Pokemon you start out with, which forces newcomers to rely on other Pokemon besides their starter. Now that's what I like the most about this battle. It teaches newcomers that relying only on the starter is not the wisest strategy to beat the game, that they need to catch many different Pokemon and train them so that they're ready for anything the game throws at them. This battle does something the other bosses on this list do, and that's teaching the newcomers a real superpower of teamwork. This is why Siren, Cherry, and Quest are my personal favorite first bosses in gaming. I'm Yami Slayer, and if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna kick some Gen Warner ass and send them to the Null Void until they work to respect other people's opinion. And by that I mean forever. <laughs> 